please note that the following podcast contains conversations of an adult nature and some very strong language. Well, today I am very lucky to be talking to an actor who has been a welcome presence on British television for over 30 years. This year we've already seen him in Midsummer Murders and Death in Paradise and I'm so grateful for him making some time for a trip down memory lane. Mr Mark Powley, welcome to the Bill podcast. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Was it a nice surprise to be asked to talk about your career? Because there's not many interviews with you on the internet. I I haven't really done very many. And uh, yes, the answer to the question is yes, it was nice to be asked. Just to sort of think about, it was such a lovely time, though, the sort of mid-late 80s, early 90s. was a There's a sort of naivety about it compared to the business these days that maybe everyone says that when they look back 30-odd years, but that's what it feels like. So, yeah, it'd be, uh, it'd be nice to remember stuff. Well, there's a nice sort of combination of nostalgia with a recent role for you because you're a regular in Birds of a Feather, which must have been a nice gig to get. It was lovely, lovely. Yeah. There aren't very many jobs where I look back and go, oh, I didn't really enjoy that very much. They're, they're almost always, oh, that was a really, really good time. And um, No, Birds of a Feather, it was a real gift to be able to step into something that's firstly so well established and so slick. And the, the girls obviously know their way in and out all around it. And uh, it was an education working with them. And it, it's just really, really good fun. And truth be told, not a big stretch for me playing another kind of nice, nice geezer copper. Yes. Sorry, thing, which is it's not a big stretch for me now. <laughs> <laughs> and it, yeah, it was just it was a joy to be a part of. Really, really enjoyed it. Another interesting recent credit. I, I hope I've got this right. Were you the basis for a video game character? I have been. Yes, I've, I've done a couple. I did one last year. I haven't actually seen it again because I've got an Xbox rather than a PS4. But I, I, I did a lot of work on a Horizon Zero Dawn, I think it's called, yeah. That's right, yeah. Have you seen it? I've seen images of the character, uh, yeah. and it, it's quite extraordinary, because it, it's your... Does very, it look a bit like me? It's very clearly oh, your... Oh, man, that is mental. <laughs> yeah, he, he's like a monster of a man with tattoos, but then yeah, it's, it's yeah. like your eyes and... So what, what's the process behind How much work is there for you? It was extraordinary, that job. Because I think originally I auditioned for it. I think I was second choice. And then for one reason or another, the, the guy they chose first ended up not doing it. But they do, I mean, having said that, they, they drop people left, right and centre on these things because the budget is like $200 million. <laughs> bigger than a movie. And they can reshoot and change their minds and completely, you know, which is quite unusual for any kind of project like that. I did the, a lot of voiceover stuff in a little booth with it, and they strap a camera to the front of you so they can record your facial expressions and movements. Oh, wow. And then I did a lot of mocap stuff where they you have to wear those funny suits with the little dots on, the virtual space mapped out with the... I, I, I don't understand it. Oh, they, wow. <laughs> so, and then they record your movements... And that somehow gets made into the animation of the, of the thing. It's, it's totally off the scale, technology-wise. I wish I understood more about it. It's basically playing games. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Would you have ever thought at the start of your career that you'd have been doing motion capture work in the future? You know? No. I mean, I hadn't even been considered in those days. Years and years and years and years and years ago, I did a, I did a similar one. It was called, like, I don't know, Space Troopers or some such thing. And there were a bunch of, like, six of us. And we spent, like, a month pretending to be these characters out of a game. But it was, it was so unsophisticated compared to what they do now. It's a very interesting side of the business for actors. Mostly it's vocal. Mm. You've got to get the sort of the voice right. And then you have, obviously, when you play a game on a computer, you, you, you go back, you know, you can go back to the previous place where you started and repeat things and all that and all those odd little lines that, that people come out with they all have to be recorded in context and so on and so on and so on yeah. it takes a very very long time it's a blast it's it's so new that i think the thing with it is it's, it's so new no one really knows quite what it is whether it's acting or voiceover work or they have quite a lot of stunt people doing the mocap stuff 
how did your career begin? I was a very bad student as a, as a young man and I was studying A-levels, English Sociology and Politics at a sort of tertiary college in Swindon. And I was in the drama group there and the, and the guy who ran the drama group kind of gave me fair warning. He said, listen, they're going to throw you out because I was, I, was, I was a pretty poor student. He said, have you ever thought about going to drama college? And I'd never even con considered it and no one had ever suggested it. And I thought, wow, what a fantastic idea. And um, I knew my dad wouldn't be too pleased about it. So I um, applied to Central School of Speech and Drama and Lambda and the Drama Centre in secret and got auditions at these three places. And then I, I sort of came up to London on the train by myself. And I was just really lucky I got a place at Lambda. Wow. Then I had to tell my dad. <laughs> <laughs> He was pretty bloody angry, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he came around, bless him. Yeah. What year are we talking here? About 1982, something like that. Right. And, and a three-year course? It was a three-year... In those days, it was called a three-year professional acting diploma. Right. Wow. Whereas nowadays, you get a degree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a wonderful school. I had some really fabulous teachers. I think there are only as many places only as good as the teachers. Mm. There were some amazing people there, like Colin Cook and Jane Gibson. And I, I mean, I was very green and naive and knew, and, and knew very little about any of it. And there were a few people there had been doing, like, National Youth Theatre and stuff like that. So I felt like I, I was a bit, like, out of my depth for a while. And I was probably a little bit too young, with hindsight, to get as much out of it as I could. But I had a fabulous time. And they taught, you know, they taught us a lot of good stuff. And who were your inspirations on the acting front? Oh, blimey. I always wanted to be really cool, like someone like Steve McQueen. I, I was going to say, <laughs> you carry an element of him. <laughs> you really do. I aspired to that kind of level, but I, did, I never really had the drive, I think, to get, to get there. Well, you, yeah. ha you, you have a quality yours I admire. You're very still. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it, it, it's a, a terrific episode of The Bill where you're in a shed with Nick Redding. Oh, I remember it, yeah. Yeah, and, and Nick Redding is darting all around, trying to taunt you. It's, it's a lovely combination, like heaven and hell, with your two yeah, characters, you know. Remember, and yeah. you're just so still, and you're just yeah. listening to Thank him. Thank you very much. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's funny that the bill was probably just as much of a, uh, for me, and I think for a lot of the younger actors on it, just as much of a sort of learning curve as go to drama college was. Yeah. Because we did, I mean, in, in those days... At Lambda, I think we did one week uh, in three years. We did one week sort of TV course, wow. where we where we did a, a TV play called The Jail Diary of Albie Sachs. We had a wonderful teacher, Derek. Oh, I can't remember his surname, who actually gave me my first TV job on a series called Rockless Babies. Do you remember that? Oh yeah. That was. I think that was my first telly job. Was I, was, I played a panty pinching milkman on Rockless <laughs> Babies. <laughs> And, and was it before or after the bill that you made Bloody New Year? Oh, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I've been enjoying Bloody New Year. You have done your research. <laughs> it, was, it was before, yeah. Wow, you must have some stories in the making of that. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was very funny. Well, I know Barry Island quite well. That, uh, I mean, look, it was really, really good fun. Yeah. You know, we thought we were movie stars, the, the, the four or five of us who were in it. Was, I mean, it was like these bunch of people down in Wales had come up with a script and they'd managed to get some funding and it's like, let's make a film. Yeah. It was really, really like that, you know, bits of string and thrown together. The fact that we managed to get something that you could actually watch, I don't know how much sense it makes. Oh, it's great <laughs> fun. It's not one of the greatest films ever made, let's face it, but it was an Extraordinary achievement for the sort of local community. They were very involved. You get to fire a shotgun at a zombie in a horror movie. I mean, that's, that's a big <laughs> tick, isn't it? <laughs> God, I'd forgotten about all that kind of stuff. Meet a pretty grisly end uh, on the beach. Is it? Uh, do I get a, 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 an outboard motor stuck in my face? That's right, yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, you, you couldn't... Um, Steve Wilshire is the big zombie guy with the white hair who was quite a famous stuntman. But he basically was in charge, and we did, we did build, up, build up a lot of trust with him. That was actually real. That was a real outboard motor, about that far away from my face. Yeah, I know. Yeah. In this day and age, 
you get sued off the set for doing stuff like that. The things we did on that show, that, that, that health and safety would just fire everybody on the spot. Yeah. It was shocking. But, but it was like, let's do it. It was really good fun. <laughs> it was a good summer. How did you go from that to getting the part of Ken Melvin? What was the process? Truthfully, I think over the years, I've probably only ever turned down two jobs. Or maybe I've turned down a few auditions. Yeah, I, it, it was just, you know, my agent said, oh, I've got you an audition for the bill. And, it, you know, that had happened every, you know, he'd ring up and say, oh, I've got an audition for this, that or the other. And I'd just go for the audition and do my best and hopefully get the job. The, I, what might be interesting for you, actually, is originally Melvin was written, I think originally I was booked for like three episodes. And, they, and he was supposed to be a bit of a racist and a bit nasty and a sort of unsympathetic character. And I, I, not, I, I don't think I consciously decided to go against that, but I was doing everything I could to try and make sure they'd extend my contract. Right. <laughs> Put it that way. And, uh, and, and luckily, Peter Krajin, who was the producer, saw something useful in, in the character, and, and they said, oh, would you, would you stay on? And then they developed him into a much more sympathetic, sort of pretty boy, housewife's choice kind of thing. Yeah, and uh, the born-again Christian sort of... Uh... Yeah, that was a funny one. That was one of the new producers. They brought three producers to come in and work under Peter. But he was a born-again charismatic Christian and decided one of the characters should be. Right. Personally, I think it was a mistake. And it never really worked for Melvin. But there you go. Oh, I, I think he's a, a fantastic character. Because he's not the one putting it in everyone's face, is he? It's everyone no. else is interested in it, mm. as opposed to him being a preacher or anything like that. Yeah, yeah. He was a quiet Christian. And I know, I mean, it was a very useful character to have knocking around, but it, it felt like something that was sort of imposed on the character rather than something that developed organically. You know what I mean? Um, I think I, I, I wanted Melvin to be a bit racier and cooler, and obviously he wasn't. Right, <laughs> <laughs> What were your favourite elements of him to play? Um, two things, probably. Firstly, he was very honest, which is a great thing to play. And also, he was a genuine... And there are a lot of couples... I've met a lot of couples over, over the years, obviously. Character-wise, he genuinely wanted to sort of make a difference doing good things. Yeah. Uh, 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 and every now and again, you'll bump into a couple like that, or a doctor, or whoever it happens to be, and you go, right, yeah, you're kind of in the right place. He was all right. Oh, Ken. It must have been a lovely period in your life. Oh, it, it was it was brilliant, a really brilliant time. I think I had about I had nearly four years, and it was just blissful. Yeah, I mean, I, I was you know I was young, I was earning ridiculous amounts of money comparatively. Uh, it's more than I'd ever seen before, and I, I mean, I, I I was relatively sensible. I managed to get on the property ladder, which is. Thank God I did it then when I had some money and uh, I got married. I think I had my first, I think I had Bell when I was still in the bill. It was just a gas. We had a ball. You know, we were, getting, we were being watched by 15 million people two or three nights a week. Yeah. It was like being proper famous. It was really strange. And um, um, what was the fame element like for you to deal with? Honestly, I loved it. I've never had a problem with it. Right. Personally, I think I think if you take an attitude of it's a, it's an intrusive pain in the ass, then it become then it's more about how I respond to things. If that's the attitude I take, then I'm going to get trouble. Whereas um, the way I look at it, I mean, even now, because I'm not, I don't I have no profile as such, but people sort of look at me and go, "I know you from somewhere, don't I?" All that kind of stuff, and I I, I get to. Um, engage with people on a slightly deeper level than normal rather than just sort of saying hi in the street, which is a real gift. I've met some amazing people just because they've gone, you're that bloke off the bill, aren't you? <laughs> so, no, I, I've, always, I've always really enjoyed it. It's lovely to be recognised. My kids used to love it as well when Daddy was recognised in the street. Oh. There's some brownie points to be had there. But I think, I think there's only once I had a bad experience with some drunk guy in an, in an off-licence, and I just left. So, no, I, I, I had a ball, mate. I really, really loved it. And who, from your co-stars, were your, were your best pals? I suppose me and Nick used to knock around quite a lot. We had quite a few, a lot, lot of mutual friends from sort of West London, North West London area, kind of Camden, Shepherd's Bush crowd. And Mark Wingett, I was very, quite close. He introduced me to scuba diving. 
Oh, cool. So we used, to, we used to go off and do these mental scuba diving weekends. He had this huge old Land Rover, long wheelbase Land Rover we used to sleep in in car parks and stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, do. I, look, I look back very fondly on that time. Larry Dan, surprising enough, because there's quite a big age gap. But we, he introduced me to golf, which I still struggle with once or twice a year. Because uh, he was a member of the, there's a thing, an entity called the Stage Golfing Society. And you got quite a few of the Bill guys in it. When we first started, because all the sort of people my age, or by and large, were pretty green. We, had, we hadn't been around for very long and we didn't know much. And the sort of structure of the, of the program, where you had your three sergeants, Larry, Roger, Leach, and obviously Eric, they kind of, I remember feeling very much that they sort of took us under their wing and gave us a lot of, we'd go for a pint around the corner after we finished work sometimes. And I felt very looked after and they gave us a lot of good advice. Well, it must have been lovely for a young actor because, it, you know, you've got all these great guest stars coming in as well. It must be mm. one of my favourite of yours. And it's the first episode you get top billing called Life and Death. And you have to go and inform a lady that her husband has died and then turns out... Uh, the wrong one? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I remember, I remember. Yeah, a lovely actress called Ma Maureen O'Reilly. Wow. And her husband is played by Arthur Blake. And these guys have been around for years in Zed Cars and Dixon and Doc Green. Yeah. It must have been like a treasure trove for you to be able to watch and learn. Well, in a way, I mean, I, I did used to think of it at the time because, you know, back, back in the day, you'd hear actors going on about, oh, when I was in rep, you know, at, at Frinton or something, and they'd be doing two or three shows a month, rehearsing one show and putting on another show and then doing a musical and a panto at Christmas and all that. And that was how they sort of learnt their kind of craft, the same way working with different people or from different companies. I think that's what the bill did for a lot of people back in the 80s and 90s. Because it's, it's a sort of similar setup, and you get every time you work with someone, whether they're good or bad, frankly, there's something to be learned. We, we got, I mean, it was a blessing to be able to work with so many fantastic people, really. And, and directors, you know, you're working with maybe two or three different directors in the same week, and again, you pick up stuff all the time. It was a, it's, a, it's a great gift, shows like that. Another uh, lovely actor, you, you had a nice bit of business with David Ryle. He, he takes you to. Uh an abandoned chocolate factory. I do remember the chocolate factory because I still drive past it. It's up the road. On the way, my, one of my daughters lives in Kensal Rise and when I go and see her, I drive past it. It was the basement. It did actually used to be a chocolate factory, apparently. Oh, cool. And we shot in the basement. It's offices and stuff now, but it's still there. It's very strange, actually, because I live. I moved to Shepherd's Bush when I got the bill because we used to film it up in Barbie Road, which is, you know, just up elaborate growth and I've lived here ever since in different places uh, so I still I mean uh, uh, pretty much every day I'll drive past a chemist and I'll go <laughs> I arrested a junkie in there you know it's like, it's stuff like that it's, it's all the history of it is all around this part of London for me it's very weird <laughs> but in a good way a location you probably don't go to very often is uh, when you and Trudy Goodwin had to uh, collect Arena Brook she was a demonstrator and you're on the motorway oh, yeah. that's a good episode it's a brilliant one. She was fantastic, Arena Brooke. Yeah. I'd say there's an infamous outtake from that. But we were using we used real handcuffs. I end up being completely gulled by Arena Brooke's character and being cuffed with my own handcuffs. <laughs> and there's a bit where and those handcuffs, when you press them, they just get tighter and tighter and tighter. And i and I I leant back on something or I fell on the bed and they tightened right onto the bone of my wrist. Oh. And there's me going, ah! And everyone's just standing around laughing because they think I'm messing about. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't funny, but yeah, they, they used it in like an outtakes clip run someone put together. They, you know, so they used that. Did the actions of the character ever annoy you? Do, do you ever think, well, a real copper probably wouldn't have let her go into the bathroom or, you know, was that ever... A... No, I don't think so. I don't think we did anything that was so... I mean, we had a... a, a I think the original guy was called Will something. We had a, fanta a succession of fantastic police advisors where we'd be able to check. And the truth is, I don't think there was anything that happened in the show that didn't ever happen in real life at one point or another. So Melvin was a bit of a, you know, he was naive and trusting and a bit of a lemon at times. But then <laughs> I, I am, so we all are. <laughs> kind of, I don't think we did anything where you think, ah, that never happened. <laughs> yeah. What was it like working with Trudy Goodwin? 
Oh, she was wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I, I, pretty much everyone on the show, some of them were more fun than others. But, you know, Trudy was always just faultless, really. She did it for years and years and years and years, didn't she? Yeah, 24 years. Bloody hell. Yeah. Uh, that, which was going to be a question of mine. I mean, because presumably you had the option. You could have just carried on. Yeah. I, well, I don't know, call it arrogance or naivety, but essentially I got bored. After about three years, I got bored, and, uh, which is really stupid because it was a great job and good money and blah, blah, blah. But um, I think one of the reasons I wanted to be an actress is because you get to do different stuff. And, you know, when you've done 100 plus episodes, kind of start, you, it's hard not to repeat yourself, basically. Mm. And it, it started to feel like working in a bank or something where you get up and you're going to work and blah, 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 blah. blah. Yeah. So you know, I went to see the producer, and uh, and I said, "Look, I want to leave, and I want you to kill me, so I can't come back." <laughs> <laughs> because because I knew that, and I and I and I would have asked to come back at times <laughs> when times were hard. Uh, so I'm quite pleased, and he was pleased because he gave me the opportunity just to blow up the entire police station. Yeah, and a lovely storyline to go out on, and a little romance with Kikamara and his character. That's right. It was a good way to go. And it was very real, wasn't it? Because at one point in our lives, we've all had our heads turned by a woman and we've, we've underperformed at work. And... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was yeah. a real guy, wasn't he, Melvin? Yeah. Like they wrote him. I think he was very, very well written for the most part. Mm. Really, really. Uh, and, and not too kind of complex. No. You know, the kind of, he is what he, he, he is, what he is Ken Melvin. Yeah. It's really funny, I've never spoken about him in these terms before. Is it nice, sir? Uh... Yeah, I've, I've a fondness for him, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's a good bloke. He's a sort of guy, I wouldn't, you, I wouldn't mind being trapped in a lift with him, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it must be a strange feeling, because you, you're referring to him as a real guy, as it were. I guess so. Well, it wasn't me. No, and, you, and it must be strange when that character gets blown up in spectacular fashion, you know, is, is that a strange thing? It was quite weird, it was quite sad, I went down, because they moved to Merton straight away, I went down and watched them filming my funeral, which was bizarre, and I met, with hindsight, perhaps I should have just kind of cut my ties a bit, but it was very hard to let go of, and obviously a lot of the people on the show were very much in my sort of social life in those days. Uh, it sort of became a, a tradition later that old characters would return for fallen yeah. and you had Colin Blumenau and Robert Hudson come back for your funeral which was the first I think that's right yeah. yeah I mean is it a nice bit I mean it's a bit of history really isn't it when you're the first because Nick Redding never died on screen no I know it was, yeah, it was the first sort of big death yeah yeah was, that's kind of cool and what an explosion was it Stuart St Paul Stuart St Paul bless his heart yeah I've worked with him quite a few times since I tell you what happened there was there was a commercial on TV for, I think it was Heineken, and it was a guy, and he'd surf out of a pub on a big wave, he'd surf out through, out through the pub doors. People kept ringing me up going, oh, I saw you in that commercial. I'm going, what are you talking about? I saw you in that commercial. And, uh, and then Stuart showed up on set as, as my double. Oh. And it was like, it's you! <laughs> it's you! And we do look uncannily alike. It's, it's a peculiar. He's a lovely man, a lovely man. A great, great stunt artist. Yeah. Like, he doubled for me on a few things over the years. And it'd be like, ah, it's you. Ah. <laughs> Presumably you watched that bang. Can you still remember being there and seeing that happen? I can remember spending quite a lot of time lying in the rubble with the water spraying and blood everywhere. Is that quite a long time to shoot? Yeah. Um, and I remember dying in the ambulance, which upset my mother quite a lot. Other than that, I don't remember much about it. I remember driving that lovely XJS. Uh, was it kept a secret, your exit? I mean, nowadays, spoilers uh, are everywhere, aren't they? Do you know, I can't remember. I don't remember doing, like, interviews or, or anything about it. No. I, I read on Twitter someone uh, saying, I, I still weep for Ken Melvin. He died the night before my GCSE exams and I couldn't concentrate. That's so sweet. Oh. And so what was life like immediately after the bill, in terms of your career? It dive bombed, mate. I had a really, really bad year. Right. It was quite a shock to the system. 
uh, because in I mean I, maybe maybe I timed it badly, but um, in those days they didn't want people with profile. So whereas nowadays, you know, you could leave EastEnders and go into the Bill and then go into Emmerdale and stuff like that, and they'd sort of that would be a part of your shtick. In those days, they didn't want you going into a show and going, oh, and people would go, oh, it's that bloke from the Bill. Mm. I got I, I got next to nothing for at least a year. It was quite hard. it was a real shock to the system, especially financially. Having not really been that sensible in terms of savings and stuff like that, I remember me and my um, my ex-wife Janice just sort of scrabbling stuff together and trying to get by. Then I got a huge, big, fat commercial. I can't remember what it was for. And we and we moved to we moved to a two-bedroom flat because we just had another baby. But no, initially it was really difficult, honestly. Well, I mean, it's interesting that later in your career you do that thing of of hopping from Emmerdale to Coronation Street to Hollyoaks. What do you think changed in between for, for that to happen then? Did the landscape of TV change, do you think, where people liked the familiarity of faces? I think it became a lot more about kind of celebrity, I guess. But it's funny, I mean, the truth is none of those, they were, they were never sort of conscious decisions. It was just someone offered me a job and I said yes. There's been no plan or anything like that. You've had that lovely birds of a feather now, but you, you've always gone between mainstream drama and situation comedy, which not a lot of actors get to do, do they? Because it's a very different discipline. Never really thought about it, actually. I mean, your performance in Game On is lovely. Oh, that is one of my better pieces of work. Yeah, it's funny. I um, Again, you know, it's just that's just the way things panned out. I mean, I, I, there, must be a, there must be other actors who sort of flip between the two. I think I was just lucky. I mean, on the one hand, I think a lot of the jobs I got are just because I'm kind of nice to work with. And people, and by the, by the, after about sort of five or ten years, what I found is that most of the jobs I got were people who'd worked with me before and thought, oh, Mark would be good at that. Let's get him in kind of thing. There's a lot to be said for just getting on with people and showing up on time and knowing your lines, <laughs> you know. It always interests me with situation comedy if you're performing in front of a live studio audience but you're still pitching it for tv it took a while to get used to that right it is a very different discipline you have to really think about it and it is and it is midway between theater and tv basically Mm. Uh, i think for me the thing i the audience stuff is more about energetically feeding off them so you get you get that changes how the show the finished article of the show turns out and most of the time, audiences really want to be there. So you get a great response. But as an actor, for me, in sit- sitcom-wise, the, the technical side of it is the most important. So I need, to be, I need to know which camera's on when and all that kind of stuff. Otherwise, you can't make a show. It, it keeps you on your toes. It's a re- I, I, love, I love sitcom for precisely that. Because you've got so many different things to think about. It's very stimulating in terms of working. One of your um, most famous roles, which I hope you don't mind me asking about, is in Bronson. It's an extraordinary scene, isn't it? Yes. It must be very difficult, not just for Tom Hardy, but for you. That's that's a very intimate position for two actors to be in. Let me tell you how that works, actually, because it's an, quite an interesting well, might not be, but I think it's an interesting story. The director is a genius, is Nicholas Winding Refn. He's done a lot of amazing stuff since. I mean, he really is a genius. He's, he's a, that sort of mad genius, genius. But when I went, I went to see him, I actually read for a different part. And then the casting director called me back. And I thought I was going to read again. And um, he took the script out of my hand and said, oh, you won't need that, as I went in. And, and, and Nicholas was there and he said, he said something like, so, Mark, um, what's your favourite movie? And it was like, and we're having a cup of coffee. And I thought, shit. And we had a little discussion about movies. And then he said, well, I'll see you on set, man. Bye. <laughs> and that was it. And I'd got the job. I didn't even know which job I'd got. Wow. And then I obviously got the script through the post. Then I showed up on the day. Obviously, Tom Hardy is an extraordinary actor. I mean, he's one of the greats, for me, anyway. And uh, with, they'd set up, it was an amazing, it was quite an enclosed set. It was quite intimidating, dark. To, I guess the, the whole feel of the piece was like that. And they had these amazing guys, real prison guys who knew Bronson, who were, like, advising on the show. Tom had, had massively bulked up. His body's extraordinary. He's got his own tattoos. They had to cover up his own tattoos and then put tattoos on top of the cover-up, 
which caused some issues under the lights and they were that all melted and stuff. And the director, am I allowed to swear on this? Yeah, sure. The director, you know what Nicholas used to do? He'd set it up and we ran a few sort of tryouts. And he'd say, come on, and he'd shout at everybody, say, come on, everyone, come on, let's fuck, I want to see some fucking, come on. And it was like this mental environment. And he literally, we ran a few times and had this great overhead camera shot and a few other cameras sort of hidden around that, just the set of the cell. And Nicholas Winding Refn literally had the script and he threw it and he said, fuck that, fuck that. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he said, just fucking do it. I want to see some fucking. I want to see some fucking. And I, know, I didn't know if he actually wanted to see us actually fuck. Right. <laughs> this may have happened. <laughs> but, and, and we ran it. And all that stuff with the margarine and stuff we, yeah. was completely made up on the spot. Whoa. And we basically, Tom's driving the scene. So he's just doing what he's doing. And I'm improvising around him. And that, that whole scene is pretty much made up before the, the telephone comes in and stuff. It was just. And I was fucking terrified, man. Yeah. I mean, it, it, he's a big bloke. Don't mind. Yeah. And yeah. obviously my character is supposed to be terrified anyway. It was one of those weird, it took me about a day to get over it. I bet. I went home and I was like shell-shocked. <laughs> it was bizarre. But it's a good, what a great film. Out of nothing, you'd think, how can you make a film out of this? It's a brilliant piece of work. Don, I feel very privileged to have been a part of it. Absolutely. <laughs> a lovely film role, I suppose, for two reasons for you. Side by side. Oh. Yeah. And you've got the work of your extremely talented daughter, Belle. She's amazing, isn't she? She is fantastic. That was such a gift. And that was a funny one. It was one like they, they, um, they were struggling with the casting. And it was like, it was quite, as a relatively last minute kind of thing where I knew one of the producers. And she said, and she, and she said I think she said, like, well, why don't you do it? And I'm like, oh, my God. And I started to think about it. I thought, oh, God, it would be amazing. It, that was just a gift. Being able to work with Belle was so lovely. I did actually, I played her dad in an episode of Am I High? Because she was in that for a long time. And that was lovely. But, yeah, that, we, we, to, to spend time with her. And we had, we had quite a lot of time on that shoot. So we could really work things and talk about them and, and talk them through. Uh, it, it, it was, how many dads get a chance to do that, you know? Yeah. And you must be so proud. I mean, her career. Oh, she's amazing. I spoke to her this morning. She's just come back from um, filming being Matthew McConaughey's crack whore daughter <laughs> in Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah, she, she's done some extraordinary work. I couldn't be more proud. Yeah. Been very lucky. Well, I, I read an interview with her where she quite proudly explained that, you know, Whilst she's got parents in the industry, she's done it herself. She's gone to work like you did. You went and you went. Yeah, and... we didn't. We didn't encourage her at all, really. Quite. I mean, we didn't. I don't think we discouraged her at all. I think we were always supportive. But it kind of, it really just kind of happened for her. She she got MI high. They were street casting around the schools in West London, and she just came home and said, "Oh, they were doing this thing at school today. The BBC are doing a series," and it was like, "Oh yeah." And the next thing you know, she's in a TV series. It's like, and she got the Viva Bill before it finished. She just gets off the stuff. I mean, she's that good. That's the thing. There is a sort of, there's the, there's a, there are sort of levels and levels and levels. And I was, I mean, I've only ever been offered half a dozen jobs in thirty years. But she, all of a sudden, people were saying, "We do this, and we do this, and we do this." And yeah. I think one of the one of the best things for her is that it was never, a, it wasn't like, "Oh, I really want to be an actress," ever. Right. It was just like, oh, this is an interesting thing to do. And the, the passion she has for it now has sort of developed over the years, which I think is a lot healthier than a lot of people go into the business going, oh, I want to be famous, I want to be an actor, blah, blah, blah. And uh, that's not really what it's about. Well, you've both got it. I mean, she, she's fantastically talented, but so, so are you as well. There is a, You're very kind. No, it's, it's true. There's a real genuine quality. You're very watchable. You're always like, even when, even like even Lewis, when you're playing a corrupt superintendent, mm. you're still, you're still likable. I think, I think that stood being good stead over the years. I, 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 a lot of the work I've had has been relatively unsympathetic characters or, or characters who do bad things, but the audience needs to have a degree of sympathy with. Yeah. So I'm, 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 I think I'm quite good at playing arseholes who are a little bit likable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's my, 
become my shtick. <laughs> so for the future, what what uh, what shows would you like to add to your your CV? What what would you who would you love to work with? I don't have any great. Oh, I'd really love to work with so and so. I'd really like to do that show or anything like that. It's never really worked like that for me. I just kind of take what comes. Is it a nice feeling that your work from 30 years ago is still being enjoyed? Absolutely lovely. I wish they'd repeat them all because then I'd get some money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do notice on one of the one of the sort of smaller channels they're repeating the new ones. That's right. There must be a place for the old ones. It's probably too expensive because we were. It was the eighties. We were on really good money. <laughs> yeah. well, quite right too. They couldn't afford to pay Eric. I bet that's probably what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You've given your time, very. I mean, I'm, I'm really grateful for you giving your time. As listeners have got to listen to your memories for free, is there a charity you'd like to nominate that people can pop a couple of quid to if they feel so inclined? Oh, very much so. The Samaritans is my favourite charity. I, I, I had an elder brother who killed himself quite a long time ago, oh. and, I, and I've been volunteering for the Samaritans uh, in uh, West London. So, yeah, I think that's a good thing. And what is your message to fans of Ken Melvin 30 years on, uh, <laughs> people who've stuck, stuck with you and... Ken has followed you around in some form or another. What's your message to people? My message to people? I don't know. Just enjoy life. Yeah. Uh, nothing deep and philosophical. Enjoy life. That's quite a good Ken Melvin line, I think. I think he'd be it happy is. with that. I think Ken would be happy with that. <laughs> yeah. Mark Powley, thank you so much. I'm beyond grateful. I really am. You're very, very welcome. It's been lovely chatting about the old days. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> So, so grateful to Mark for sharing his memories and for being such a laugh. Uh, he's been a favourite actor of mine for many years, so to have the opportunity to interview him was a, a real privilege and a joy. is the Samaritans. Their vision is that fewer people die by suicide. They work to achieve this vision by making it their mission to alleviate emotional distress and reduce the incidence of suicide feelings and suicidal behaviour. You can make a donation or perhaps do what Mark does and volunteer with them via samaritans.org. It's not long until Christmas, so I wanted to do something a little special for you loyal fans of The Bill and listeners to these podcasts. So throughout December, on The Bill Podcast Facebook page, uh, you will be able to enjoy your own Bill-themed advent calendar uh, via 25 daily posts that I'm going to be doing. Uh, these will include photographs of the cast from a large collection of spotlight books that I have, thanks to my friend Bernard Holly, himself a wonderful actor, and has guest starred in the bill on a couple of occasions. Uh, Spotlight is the directory for casting directors to use, and I've got the editions of 1987 and 88, and 1994 and 95. So uh, I'm sure a few of you will have enjoyed the On This Day posts on the bill Facebook page. I'm going to be filling December with as many as I can. I will also be announcing the first batch of interviewees for The Bill Podcast 2018, what you might call Series 2. I haven't announced any of the recent interviewees. I thought it would be nice to save those for a few Christmas surprises for you. One thing I can confirm for December is that we'll be hearing from a man who is doing some incredible work for his charity Safe in Kenya. And we also chat about a certain Sunhill copper who drove a Porsche. Next time on the Bill Podcast. And my agent phoned up and said, "Oh, the, the Bill is going to go twice weekly." It was when it was first went to those half-hour episodes because it had been an hour on Friday night, and it was hugely popular as a show. And I'd I'd not really seen it, so I watched some episodes and thought, "Oh, this is really good show." Uh, you know, they gave me the sort of brief of Ramsey, and she said, "And they're looking for the real thing." 
I went, well, what do you mean they're looking for the Well, they want an East Ender. And they said, well, I'm a Londoner. It's fine, you know. They said, no, no, they want to, they want to, you know, they want Ramsey. Okay. And, um... Uh,